as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomena. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. Straight into the slingshot of it. Tonight, we're talking Tony Todd, the one, the only actor. With me is the action elites, Jonathan Mark. What's up, everybody? Ah, the sky. We got Nathaniel Johnson of At the Devil's Door. How are you? <laughs> uh, at the Devil's Ball, yeah. Uh, good. At it's good Devil's to meet you guys. Ball. Yeah. <laughs> Danny Bennett from Legion Podcast Network. <laughs> Hey, it's good to be here. Good to talk about some uh, fantastic blue collar actorship. Yes, uh, what we're doing, everybody. Michael Madsen and Lance Hendrickson. We've already done plenty of the Hammer Horror guys, and I'm I'm telling you, when we did John Carradine, we were just, just doing endless impressions of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> William Shatner episode was great. Lou Diamond Phillips was kind of the one that got us back on the acting bandwagon. We had done one. The, the one that started all was Bruce Campbell. We were just like, okay top 10 roles and then after a while we were just like yeah fuck it I'm, I'm, I'm tired of keeping track so let's just name as many of the roles that are just worth seeing nice and, and if you want to be campy if you want to say hey it's a bad movie but you just totally see it that's fine too <laughs> oh so tony todd where the hell do you know him you know him as the chilling voodoo-esque folklore villain in the Candyman franchise and its reboot. You probably know him also as traitorous mercenary leader Captain Darrow in The Rock. We've seen him in countless other recurring movie and TV roles, including Wolf's brother Kern in the Star Trek Next Generation franchise. You've seen him as General Juma, the South African terrorist on 24, and plenty of other uh, recurring and giant movie appearances, including the Final Destination franchise, Stargate SG-1, Platoon, and how can we possibly forget Homicide Life on the Street? So, with <laughs> further ado, why everyone does tony rock i'll let the thing go first uh yeah well what uh, tony i mean obviously the thing about the, the probably the thing the most to know about tony todd of course is that uh that voice of his is oh, uh tony is Candyman, it's definitely the thing that's the <laughs> most that's the most famous about him um in fact to the point now that he's been doing a lot of uh voice acting roles um most Absolutely. recently i was so excited to see him as uh, the voice of dark side on uh some of the more recent animated DC comics movies. Yeah, he did that role in quite a lot of not only just the cartoons, but like even like online, like DC online or some shit like that. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah he's, I think his next project is actually he's voicing Venom in the next Spider-Man video game or something to that effect. I um, would bet. Yeah. Yeah. And, so he's doing. He's done all that stuff. But uh, to me, I mean, obviously, I run a, a horror podcast, and so we're the most we're the most familiar with him over there from. Uh, not only Candyman, but also for um, his wonderful turn in uh, the remake of Night of the Living Dead, where he played. Yeah, the character shame of on me. I knew I was forgetting something. <laughs> yeah, and he was—he uh, uh, took over the role from uh, Dwayne Jones, who played him for uh, George Romero. 
Uh, and it was probably the first time I had saw, seen him in anything was then um, in like 91, 92, when I was, uh, you know, uh, like 12 or 13. And I saw that Night of the Living Dead and just he was so good in that, that, uh, you know, I became a lifelong fan. So. Uh, did you hear uh, Court on Cinema Psyops episode when he covered that movie? He had some great theories about it that I was like, man, everyone should revisit this more and more and see if they get that impression from that rewatch. But he talked about how he met Tony Todd at a convention and he actually just, he went, he went balls out. He's like, I not only love this more than the original, but you are the best impression of Ben. And he was like, no, no, don't ever say that. Oh, Dwayne Jones. Oh, <laughs> inspiration yeah, to us to, all. <laughs> he was yeah, very to, humble. <laughs> yeah, to bring, to, to uh, yeah, I would think to actually to, uh, to talk to Tony Todd about Dwayne Jones. I mean, uh, Dwayne Jones, of course, obviously was such a huge trailblazer in terms of uh, a black actor um, totally. taking on a lead role uh, at a time when that wasn't really accepted, um, that Tony Todd would, would only be, would, would be a fanboy of Dwayne Jones. And uh, yeah, and yeah. he, you know, how he got it actually. He mentioned on the mess, not Masters of Board, that's a different awesome Showtime show, but uh, that show Eli Roth hosted on AMC and Shudder. Um, uh, yeah, the uh, the uh, history of horror, history yeah. of horror. He, I don't know if you heard the interview, but it was cool how he's like, Yeah, I, I got that from my platoon and criminal justice co-star uh Forrest Whitaker you know we had just done Platoon stayed in touch did an HBO movie called Criminal Justice and Whitaker's like hey I'm telling you all these agents and all these other people I'm telling you this remake may not be your critical darling but it is heating up it's going to get you some roles you gotta take this now (laughs) yeah Yeah, it's like man I wish more people talk about that instead everyone wants to talk about you know Tom Savini, you know, disowning it. I'm just like, I don't give a fuck about that. It's a great movie. So <laughs> I want to yeah. know about the making of the makeup and more details of the scenes. I just found the work print off of archive.org. I'm like, I'm gonna have to watch that. And there's apparently just like different gorse inserts. So. Yeah, Savini Savini's come around for uh come around on it lately. Um, oh really? Yeah, yeah. I think there's actually a, a new a new version coming out sometime soon the the version oh, you've ever seen that it again yeah. <laughs> but he's uh and then he uh he uh wrote a book recently savini about his whole career and i think that it uh he revisited it for the first time after a long long time of not really bothering with it and uh is much more proud of it now than he was um Some so yeah it's just need it's, the ego stroke after a while it's like they need you need after the 50th time where they got in famo for it they finally got to embrace it but it just sucks that it's yeah. got to go through that process here it's like come on dude be proud of your work even if the producer was a cock or just yeah you, know, you hated working on it if you got a good product you know it's <laughs> Yeah, he's yeah, but I mean, it's uh, it's such a good it's such a good turn for Tony Todd, and it was the the was the probably the role that turned things around for him uh, in mm-hmm. terms of getting him a lot more work. So, um, in yeah, fact, Babylon Five connection there, Patricia yep. Tallman. Yep, Patricia Tallman. <laughs> she's uh, later on there, and he's later in one of their best uh, TV movies as a general who has to sacrifice himself. Like we're talking to a kamikaze run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I, I um, uh, but I've seen, um, but yeah, we we did the Candyman trilogy not too long ago on at the Ball, and we that were was our favorite last yeah, year. Yeah, and we were uh, we kind of uh, we were pretty hard on uh, the sequels, part two and three, but we never had anything negative to say about Tony Todd whatsoever. Like he just owned the role. Yeah, part uh, two kind of did the whole let's just do an origin thing, and it was just like it or hate it for everyone. But yeah, part yeah. three, I know he's not happy of. Like apparently, someone said on an IMDb blurb that at some convention around circa 2013, he was doing a panel, and he's like, "Yeah, next question." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that doesn't surprise me. But I mean, which he, is a shame because he was like executive producer, so I think he had like extra time to conceive the story, or I don't know, just more range yeah. on the acting so i think it's watchable as a standalone x-files episode but the character does just show up out of nowhere to where you're like what does this have to do with anything more or less yeah it's it's an awkward movie but uh but yeah he's <laughs> he's great in he's still great in it i mean he he's uh he's always good uh and he's done so he's done a lot of low budget uh horror pictures over the over the over his career as well oh, a lot of them everyone not, signs him up yeah and he's not they're not 
a lot of them aren't particularly good. I mean, I do remember seeing a movie. I think I watched it because he was in it. He's literally in it for like five minutes at the beginning and then mm-hmm. bails out. And it's always like, oh, okay. Uh, I, I actually came to watch Tony Todd, but now I got to watch these other people. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's, uh, he's supposed to be a, a, a great uh, working actor. You know, he, he just kind of takes roles and does his best with them. And I think that he's always been uh, a super fascinating watch. Oh, totally. I like all these B-movie actors, I try to look up some of their works and sometimes they're just like impossible to find or, and I mean, when he starts off, he's in movies like Colors and uh, Lean on Me, but they're not even speaking roles. They're just featured, you know, he's got a name and everything, but it's like, yeah. like you, you forget he's in those. Uh, I just saw the MacGyver episode he was in and I, I totally forgot he was in that. It's just because it's just such a brief beginning role. And in, yeah, I mean, Platoon, he is featured but yeah. you could easily forget forget him along with the others because you know it's just such a giant casted movie. But I I know one that keeps getting brought up on various forums uh, that was like by Empire Pictures is Enemy Territory. It's like this assault on Precinct Thirteen type film. Okay, where these like all these various just gang members are cornering these this insurance salesman, and he's like one of the main gang members. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one either. Uh, yeah, he's uh, but yeah, I think it's I mean, on YouTube. So yeah, he's done a he's done so many films, um, and so many appearances. I actually forgot he was in The Rock until uh, I logged into this Zoom. Really? And, yeah, one of, and uh, there's a uh, somebody with a. Uh, I had forgotten all about The Rock, even though I love The Rock. I but I, I fucking money. Yeah, I mean, yep. like you know. Uh, you know, it, it's, it has some wonderful moments like Nick Cage being like, are you a music fan? He's like, I don't, you know, are you an Elton John fan? He's like, I no, I don't listen to soft ass shit. And they're like, you know, he's like, well, you're the rocket man. And like, shoots him out the oh, window. Man, so uh, yeah, it's a great moment. And I totally, uh, <laughs> you're the rocket until man. <laughs> it didn't even, th- I didn't even think about it until I, I, I logged on to this and then saw uh, Jonathan has uh, Tony Todd's photo of, of him and the rock in it. And I'm like, oh my God, I totally forgot. Yes, of course, the rock. That's, I love that movie. And I forgot that he was, I forgot that he was in it when I was thinking about Tony Todd roles. But yeah. Uh, all good. Um, uh, Danny, uh, what made you decide, hey, you know, this is an actor I'll keep a lookout for whenever he shows up on screen? <laughs> well, you know, j- just like uh, just like Nathaniel was saying, the, the remake of Night of the Living Dead is is just a masterpiece. Uh, I, I agree that it it's hard to it's hard to cast dispersions at the at the first, and I'm not going to do that. But... Oh, damn! I was guest starring on another mm-hmm. podcast talking about it, and like everyone just wanted to dick slap it. I'm like. There are worse movies out there. And I mean, these guys were just like such elitists. It's like, whatever everyone else says, that's the truth. I'm like, that's not how a movie review goes. You cite yeah, your opinion. Wait, wait, which, one, the- which one were they Were they attacking? Oh, just Night of Living Dead. Like, just not even giving it a chance. Just acting the, like, oh, the, where's the, the original remake? Or the original or the remake? The yeah. remake. And oh, okay. Like, like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and you get but a lot like of that. Just, I mean, the, the first one broke so much ground. But, you know, it, it's a tremendous movie, and a lot of it is because Tony Todd is so intense. I mean, when he punches through that door, and they're, they're, they're going to barricade the house, and, uh, and they've got, you know, they got those doors upstairs, and the guy's like, oh, this, this should be good, this should be good. He's like, it's not good oh, enough. Like, and then he says, you know, no, no, it'll it'll be all right. And he punches his hand through it. He says, "Not good enough." Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just so good, that yeah. kind of stuff. He lends this this gravitas to all these these parts. And you know, not only can he do that, but he can also be the you know the the sage wise, like you said, the voodoo priest or or whatever he needs to be. But uh, just and when I met him, that intensity you know, leads through. I, I was I was kind of scared of him for a minute or two. Yeah, um, I, I met Robert Lasardo, who's been in all kinds of movies and uh he, he he was like if anyone you ever meet at any of these conventions please have it be tony Totten. I'm like ah I <laughs> sweetest man ever <laughs> yeah actually uh uh it's not really my story to tell but uh a friend of mine who I, I used to be on a podcast with her over at uh uh, uh simple sarah's horror menagerie she apparently met him recently at this past summer at uh, at a convention, and it was her daughter's birthday. Her daughter's like fifth birthday, and apparently Tony Todd sang "Happy Birthday" to her. No, um, really? nice. yeah, apparently he's yeah. That supposedly he is like the the nicest man. Like he she, she was like, oh, it's my daughter's birthday, and he actually sang "Happy Birthday" to her. It was very it's a very sweet story. Apparently he's supposed to be a super nice guy. 
I met him at the the uh, Nashville uh, tattoo and horror convention, and I was years ago. It was ten years ago or more, and uh, so so I, I I just picked out a Candyman picture for him to sign, and uh, they weren't really doing selfies as much then anyway, uh, and and I. I just, I wanted him to, to sign it, the, the line from Wishmaster, where he says, you know, his name's Johnny Valentine. <laughs> you remember yes. that name when they asked you how you lost that eye. Yeah. Oh, and, God. Uh, That's and great. He, he got kind of mad. He was like, That's not from this movie. I was like, No, it's, it's not from this movie, but I just kind of wanted you to write that. And he was like, Oh, okay. And he drew like a picture of an eye, and then he shook my hand. And dude's head is huge, man. Like his fingers were like as long as my palm and my fingers. You know, like I've he's seen huge. him use it in like interviews too. I'm like, holy fuck! I mean, <laughs> is this, yeah, <laughs> there's no way around it. You are gonna look at his hands because like he also just like acts with them like when he's describing stuff in interviews. Mm. <laughs> like I want to be on your level. Where are you going with this? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, he like you said, he's a super nice guy. But like that intensity really, really shows through. And, you know, for a minute there, I thought he was kind of, he was kind of pissed at me for, for asking for this quote from a different movie. But then I was like, no, I just like the quote. He was like, oh, okay. And yeah. he signed it. He drew a picture of an eye. I think he was just making he just, sure because you, know, you know how it is. It's like yeah. people mistake stuff all the time. And the last thing they want is just someone just writing an article saying, Tony Todd doesn't remember his movies. <laughs> 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 what the fuck's going on here? <sighs> So, John, you are the giant action fan and like you know, some sci-fi and horror. Uh, what are some other highlights for you just seeing Todd's uh, range and deep voice and just moody characters on either the good or bad side of the law? Well, for me, it was ones like The Crow... Right. Yeah, it's hard player. to forget that he's in it because it's like, but he's like near the end, but, and he just goes ape shit with the machine gun. What you love to see every time. Oh yeah. And even like in the ones like Excessive Force or yeah, do you, do you guys do any martial arts movies or strictly horror? Uh, usually, I do. Uh, we do pretty much horror. We've done a little bit of. Um, we branched out a little bit to some more like science fiction type stuff. We did like Predator. We did Blade Runner. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah. Excessive Force is just a very fun, crooked cop uh, movie starring a martial artist who was big in the 90s. That's also got Lance Henriksen. But it's yeah. cool there because they both get a giant ass fight scene. and <laughs> Which I was surprised when we watched it a few months ago. He is extremely athletic and you just wonder if you're just putting a lot of that to use and then just gave it up after a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's probably what happened there. Because, yeah, Night of the Living Dead, he is tackling people, and Patricia makes sense. She was a stunt woman, but, yeah, it's like, Tony, yeah, what, was he supposed to be a stuntman at one point? And then, yeah, there, and um, a few years afterward, and you're seeing that, and I'm like, man. <laughs> yeah, he had a lot of physical, a lot of physicality in a lot of his, uh, a lot of his earlier roles. He uh, was definitely... Um, uh, versatile in that respect uh, but yeah I mean you're right in the uh, in the 1990 Night of the Living Dead he's very physical um, and he's the w one of the reasons why I think it's such a seminal role for him is because it is uh, he is balancing like the intensity that Cam had mentioned um, you know like he's able to do those quiet quieter moments with a lot of intensity like he has a wonderful variant uh, variation on the um, uh, what where he just came from uh, monologue where he, he like snaps the stick and he's like, you know, you got to hit him in the head, you know? Uh, but he also like has this whole protracted combat sequence where he has to fight his way back to the house. And he's just literally like unarmed and just like yeah. doing like a yep. roll. He does like a front roll at one point and trips a guy. He like punches a guy in the head. He's fighting large groups of them off with his, with the, all of this really great physicality. Um, you know, it's, it's that versatility that I think brought him to the dance, so to speak. I mean, he just has that ability to both be, physically imposing while also being able to kind of bring a, a <coughs> quiet moments to it as well. So, I mean, yeah, it's just, he's, uh, he's just a really fantastic actor. Oh. Totally. Uh, an earlier role. So he, in the eighties and nineties, and he had guest spots galore um, in TV movies. Um, when he gets into the nineties, uh, he has like a recurring role in Jake and the Fat Man. It's another procedural role, but I really recommend uh, Voodoo Don. 
which is just this obscure, uh, just where he plays a Haitian voodoo priest who's just kind of going on a serial killing spree. And I saw it on Rapid Share years ago in college, and I actually didn't mind it. I thought the cast was pretty decent. It was one of Gina Dershon's first films. And uh, uh, despite it being by, you know, part of the Night of the Living Dead duo, uh, Jan John R. Russo, I actually can say this is one of his better movies, not outside of the Romero factory. Nice. It, it sounds like what's worth checking out. I mean, it's an obscurity, and I'm really surprised it hasn't popped up on any streaming platform like Amazon or Shutter or what, what like. But yeah, I, I I lost no sleep over it. I'm sure you can find a region free DVD or VHS at a thrift store, no problem. He's later in one of Dennis Hopper's evil henchmen in this obscure movie called Sunset Heat. It's an okay B movie escapade, and that was like same year as Candyman. So follow that up with The Crow. I recommend his Law and Order appearance. That's from season four oh, when Oh totally. That's when um uh you still got uh Jill Hennessy still joins the cast and everything. He plays an outspoken reverend who wants justice for a hit and run of a dead black kid. Mm -hmm. And it's just interesting to see. It's like, yes, there should be justice, but is he going to break the law? It's a cool, suspenseful episode. And furthermore, I'm sure everyone has seen uh, the season two episode of The X Files, where he's played a man with who was just had like just an unusual complexion, and he's like a Vietnam veteran who just projects his mind into other people in order to kill him. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't. I, I I haven't seen the X Files since I was like in high school. It was really no. That's fine. It, yeah, it's really it's inter it's a, it's a, one of those blind spots for me. Like a lot of people were like X Files, and I'm like, you know what? Even as a horror buff, I just was I didn't get into it at the time, and now it, there's so much of it that I'm like, I would love to start the X Files, but I I have other stuff to do for the next four years. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You know, there's you can so only binge watch so much other stuff. Yeah, and yeah. It, it that's what got him the roles. That, you know. Howard Gordon always kept him in the casting call after that. He was one of the writers, producers at that point. And so that's what got him the gigs on 24. And then that's also what got him on stuff like Buffy or Angel. So, Yeah, uh, actually, that's a good one to bring up. I, uh, I'm i a huge fan of uh, the show Angel, and he was on an episode of that. <laughs> I, I would uh, keep bumping into that episode, too. I am not even joking. It's like it's one of the last few episodes. It was like, I was like, who is that guy in giant, like, demon type you know makeup <laughs> like, yeah it's, so uh, it's called the shroud of ramon and he uh he, he mm -hmm. uh it's a uh the movie's actually interesting enough it's a, the episode is a heist episode of, of sorts but he plays like this really like evil mean uh super strong demon that uh he's giving everybody a hard time it's uh he's it's really it's a really fun role for him uh, in full, full prosthetic makeup and everything. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it's, it's a very, very fascinating, uh, fun performance from it. Absolutely. So Todd stays extremely busy with TV. I recommend the Western trilogy of Black Fox movies where he and Christopher Reeve play cowboys. Slow moving, but interesting, moody Western set in 1880s Texas. John might remember him from the Mark Dacascos martial arts film, uh, Sabotage, where he plays a very ruthless special forces assassin. Yep. I remember that clearly. One of Carrie Ann Moss's first roles pre-Matrix. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think I've heard of and that. It, if it ain't Beastmaster 3, The Eye of Braxis, I don't <laughs> want to watch. It's so much fun. <laughs> It's a good point, yeah. He uh, passes so many people's faces in as are allowed in a PG movie. <laughs> this is like... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was obviously an attempt to start some kind of... It looks like the pilot of a show. Um, and, you know, I, I see why it didn't get picked up. But, I mean, Tony Todd... I, it's, hard to, it's hard to fault Tony Todd. You know, he's just working, man. Absolutely. Well, you know, they're, not all, they're not all winners, but he's oh, giving that's it everything. Just it. If you're a B-movie actor, uh, I mean, this is it. Like, I'm cool with that. Just make that clear from the point off, as opposed to, mm, okay, you've seen better days, buddy. And don't get me wrong, some of them are just immortal. We'll always check it out. I will always see a piece of shit that has Stallone or Bruce Willis. Just can't help myself. <laughs> Planet Hollywood yeah. for the win. But they've had some duds, and you're just like, he just didn't care. Whatever. 
I'll just erase the memory of that shit fest from my mind. That's I what you have to do. Yeah, yeah, I'm not even. I'm not even sure he even does that. I think he probably still has some sense of pride of everything he's ever worked on. I think it's probably similar to like Christopher Walken. Oh, uh, Christopher you know, Walken. Yeah, yeah, where, where he's <laughs> that Christopher Walken has always been that guy who's just like, I'll be the best part of any movie, you know, happily. Uh, you know, so I think that it's just a, it's a, it's just a, a, a working class pride. I think that it's just like he'll take these roles, and, and you never best. know where he is on the side of the law. He always has a very complex backstory for whatever he's playing, and yeah, I think I think that's what echoes it. And that's years before he did every other cartoon and video game voiceover. Um, uh, I, I recommend his season four episode of NYPD Blue. He plays just a very manipulative, just petty detective who's basically just like misleading everybody and basically just wants to make them all look petulant. And it's like, no, nah, the only one petulant here is you, buddy. Well, why are you playing around and jerking us around? <laughs> right. Uh, you're not getting any credibility from this. You're just a shithead. <laughs> yeah. And it's so wild because he just looks so humble and everything. And everyone's just like, why is he saying that? That doesn't make sense with the report we got from this witness. Oh, because he wants to waste our time. <laughs> look important. <laughs> Work politics. It's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just looking at his IMDb page now and seeing stuff I've forgotten all about, like uh, uh, Minotaur. Uh, oh, for, God. Oh, yeah. God. No. Yeah. Made for, made for sci fi, -fi uh, yeah. movie. Yeah. And he plays like the titular Minotaur. Um, he had good makeup, but it wasn't as good yeah. as the one in the Angel episode. Um, yeah. True Women, he played like one of the. Uh, uh, slaves who was also like protecting the various homestead and that was cool that was an all-star cast including a young Angelina Jolie and Sally Richardson and Dana Delaney it's a pretty cool historical post-Civil War Western um, does all the various Xena Hercules guest spots I saw Stir back in the day that had Tracy Lords so you know it's quality but no seriously it was just an okay watchable mystery movie but it was he kind of was the only thing really worth watching about that one. But fun fact about Wishmaster, you know, uh, Alex Kurtzman, uh, when he, years later, apparently I watched a YouTube uh, 2013 uh, convention video with him and Andrew DeVoff, <laughs> the, the gen who we've actually covered on here, his best roles. Um, uh, and apparently Andrew said, yeah, uh, Kurtzman, he actually, you know, went to town at Photoshop one day and made a mock uh, uh, Wishmaster versus Candyman poster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he would totally be down to do it. <laughs> and yeah, he was, yeah, he was uh, in Wishmaster along as a sort of a stunt casting thing. They, uh, it really they brought, was. Yeah, they brought him in with, uh, with Kane Hodder and Robert Englund and Reggie Bannister from uh, Phantasm. Uh, and it was all just, a, and I remember being a kid when that came out, you know, and all the other kids you blinked twice, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, all the other kids in my neighborhood were like, it's obviously going to be, he's going to play the Candyman because they're going to have a wish and like, it's going to be like Candyman and Freddy. And, and I was like, I don't think that's probably going to happen. Even as a kid, I was like, that sounds like, you know, that doesn't sound like rational to me. But, and it was sure <laughs> if it was not, he just played like, he plays a, a bouncer, right? He gets killed totally. by the yeah, Wishmaster. The name's um, Johnny Valentine. <laughs> yeah, name's Johnny Valentine. Yeah, he has the, the, the threat yeah the only one of those of those classics that got to actually have like a real part in wishmaster is robert Anglin. um yeah well and plus he's playing a professor so you know he's gonna have more than one scene in it i mean it's yeah. his party that he's yeah. crashing so that makes it all the more awesome it's like oh my god you killed yeah. freddy <laughs> and actually uh, early on you mentioned um masters of horror the showtime series but he was in one of the best episodes of that too yeah, uh, and he um, plays like a guy named like the Beast, right? <laughs> yeah, he plays the Beast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah beast. in a really wonderful, uh, wonderful episode adapted from uh, Clive Barker's story, um, directed by Mick Garris, I think. And mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and he, yeah, it's a really fun meta uh, episode. I think it's on Tubi. I think that whole show's on Tubi. So I do I recommend your listeners. It. <laughs> uh, I do recommend that one for your listeners. But a lot of the Masters of Horror aren't aren't that great but there are some gems in there and i think that's uh, i think uh valerie on the stairs the name of the episode i think it's probably the best one of the entire run um it's really quite good 
Uh, well, that, it was that, just cool to see Joe Dante still getting work, you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like, there's a lot of episodes that are worth watching, but, like, the best ones are, I think, are Valley Around the Stairs and, of course, John Carpenter's uh, Cigarette Burns, which does not have Tony Todd in it. But um, but those two episodes are uh, the two that always come to mind. And, uh, and hey. Tony Todd plays um, the Beast, who's this creature that is kind of like a tall base created by uh, a bunch of different writers to terrorize their fictional character and like he and he's uh, he's just really he's quite frightening in it you know as he <laughs> always is so but yeah it's a it's a great as role scary as he was at the convention <laughs> <laughs> well yeah there you go um that's what he brings to the table literally at the table um at the table i'm not gonna lie i would give him a giant ass giant bear hug it would yeah. be giant. Yeah. I'd be it like, would. you make me take pride in actors, and they're not the ones who win awards. You're the ones who show up and kick ass. <laughs> I was totally. That. Exactly. So he was in Bram Stoker's Shadow Builder, a uh, B picture of Always Meant to See. I know that had a lot of, that had a pretty decent review from a TV guide. So it's not every day that a direct video creature feature gets a good review. So. <laughs> Is it true that he got the job as the candy man because he actually used to eat bees? I haven't heard that no, story. I didn't, I didn't, he didn't eat bees. I know he hated the stings, but he's like, hey, mate, it's made up for the fact that it was a damn good role. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. I did just kind of make that up, but hey, you know, yeah. it would be, make a good story. <laughs> I'm about to say, you ain't gonna change it. No, I, I, I actually do believe that uh, what his official stance on it is he just wasn't that, he just wasn't afraid of the bees and the, um, they asked him to do all these things and they were originally going to, I think they were going to get a stand in to do a lot of it. And he just said, no, I'll do it because all the bees and candy men were all uh, half frozen. So they were all um, docile. Yeah. Docile. Nice. Um, but also like, you know, they put, you know, some anti-inflammatory stuff in his mouth, but technically like, yeah, they, they did all this work, makeup work to make him safer, but ultimately, yeah, he completely covered himself in bees and had bees in his mouth and, uh, and everything in Candyman, and he just he just rolled with it. Um, well, especially with the effects of the time, it, you know, it meant that yeah. you could actually have the the headlining guy doing these things. You didn't have to like cut close to the mouth or any of that stuff. It was actually him, and that's that's awesome yeah. of him to do that work. Yeah, and then it was supposedly it was Virginia Madsen who was terrified of bees, and she had to kind of deal with it. But he said, uh, just, think, "We'd like to think Hollywood's progressive, but it's just such bullshit how they just wanted to just." cut more scenes out oh yeah no they can't have any interracial relationship i'm like that's the whole damn point of the movie you guys come on <laughs> it's just and, yeah she she didn't she didn't like the bees um but no. uh but fortunately we, roger ebert told a lot of critics to you know get off their ass and you know seek it out so <laughs> yeah nice yeah I, I, i'll never forget that review with siskel it's just it's like this is a terrible story. it was like what are you talking about? This is a very philosophical, moody movie. There's a reason for the gore. There's a reason for the suspense. There's a reason for the romance. <laughs> so the goal is like, might as well have not even seen the movie. <laughs> well, that's surprising that Ebert ended up liking it, though. Ebert was... Everyone uh, keeps acting like he hates horror movies. I see a lot of horror movies he likes. He just wasn't into Carpenter's, much like... Well, nah, Ebert, nah. Was, Ebert was a bit of a prude with a lot of stuff. Um, but yeah, he... he oh, yeah. He, Oh, well, he yeah. did like he did. He, he wrote did, like, Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it surprises me that actually of of the two of them, that it was Ebert, the one that liked Candyman and not uh, not Siskel. But uh, Siskel, Siskel was... hated stuff like the Terminator and gangster movies, and Ebert was fine with anything as long as he just got a sense from it. So he liked stuff like the first two Aliens and Gremlins, but. It, you know and even jurassic park but like it, if it was just a mindless slasher that's when he just would tune out and just be like what the hell is the point so i think that's the thing he he would sometimes enjoy a silly cheesy friday night movie but there's other times where it's like okay you're, you're being way too hard on this so. yeah i know he likes the thing so there you go that is true yeah that's true yeah. but he didn't like the night of the living dead remake because he's just like it's not at all like groundbreaking like the original so there you go <laughs> enough about ebert <sighs> well i didn't like hatchet so i'm not a hatchet fan either to be honest with you i have 
try to get into the various ones and everyone seems to vary on them all and i'm just like well either way tony todd it's like the first title that gets brought out whenever i see him at a convention table i'm like why he's barely in it it's just a cameo <laughs> right it's kind of like wishmaster where it's like a you know it's a, a tour of the uh, the, the well-known names of the the genre but yeah, i tried to watch it and i'll be honest I, I didn't even get through the first one entirely uh, yeah, I think I, I I watched, I remember I saw the first one and, and I was just sort of, I was okay with it. I mean, I was yeah. like, this is fine. And then they kept making them and I, I did see them all, I think. I mean, I think I only saw the sequels because Daniel Harris was in them. Um, oh, but yeah. They, uh, nope, she's yeah. not in those. <laughs> yeah. Someone uh, else says AJ Cook from Final Destination 2 is in one. Daniel Harris, she's in the Hatchet movie. She's in Hatchet 2 and 3. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking Wishmaster. Oh, no. Not Wishmaster. No. <laughs> oh, no. Daniel Hatchet. Okay. Sorry. My yeah, bad. No. But yeah, no. Uh, Hatchet, yeah. He, <laughs> he uh, yeah, but he was he was in the yeah. first Hatchet. He didn't, yeah, he was in a small and role. And he, like, that. makes an uncredited, like, cameo in part four. I'm like, why are you, why are you putting this on his resume? <laughs> yeah. I saw it and I didn't catch him anywhere. Maybe it's because I was bored, but whatever. Yeah, he plays, he plays, like, a. Uh, uh, voodoo guy in it i believe reverend reverend zombie i think is what yeah, it, it's pretty early in the movie too because yeah. I, I saw it before I, I gave up on it and and i'm not i'm not your, your target audience for that anyway so it is yeah. what it is. I, i'm not a completionist <laughs> <laughs> no I, I i totally get you yeah i mean like uh i know like for example the, uh, the same thing with the final destination films i was never really a huge fan um, yeah they were like jeepers creepers where it's like they're fun on a good day they're really terrible on a bad day and sometimes it was half and half like it's like i love the first half i hate that ending <laughs> but yeah, yeah part two just the rest of them i just could never stay in yeah part yeah. two at least just had like an emotional core at it and he was spookier there even though he's only just seen in the morgue <laughs> it's just like yeah the rest of them like part three i'm sorry that oh, that was saw before it was saw yeah. and i'm just like i gotta have be like attached to something or i just gotta have the filmmaker just winking at me saying don't take this serious you know I, I i just need something fun like that and when it gets to i mean don't get me wrong todd as it goes on and he said it before i've been in some movies i'm not proud of he's never named it <laughs> it's like uh I, I think it's really only he he's like midway through the 2000s where before he just starts you know appearing in whatever but i mean he was in the murder set pieces uh i think wasn't that a remake? No, I'm thinking of something else. But yeah, set pieces. Yeah, mur murder. Set, yeah, murder set pieces. No relation to pieces. <laughs> and not pieces. Not pieces. <laughs> uh, that was before his time. Yeah. Yeah. Pieces. Yeah, and I think I would have remembered seeing Tony Todd in that movie. Yeah, he would. He would have stuck out, stuck out like a sore thumb in that movie. Yeah, of course. Sure. You know. Yeah. Anyway, no. It Continue. Happens. He's in this one hood movie went uh caught out where he plays the main detective and it's a schlocky film but it's kind of fun for those who just remember just how every other movie had to have like a hip-hop soundtrack and a guy in the hood trying to escape and as a fugitive and jeffrey combs plays a very bizarre villain in that so he might be worth it for that might not saying is um he's in the jim winorski cheesy film the pandora project <laughs> You should just see it if you're just a Jim Wynorski fan. Um, I will see the one Vampire in Vegas that Jim Wynorski directed also. Oh, God, that was hysterical. <laughs> just that blade-type uh, suit he was wearing the whole time. It's really barely a horror movie, but it is kind of just cheesy just to look at. <laughs> uh, he's in this movie called Butter, which basically has pre-criminal mind Shamar Moore on the run. See a trend here? And he plays, uh, Ernie Hudson plays the evil record executive and Todd and Tommy Tiny Lister, rest in peace, are his right hands who basically go out of their way to kill the snitches. <laughs> nice. That actually sounds like a fun cast. I it really it. is a fun, yeah. very fast paced uh, movie. And I'm surprised at the cast in it, but yeah, it premiered on HBO and it's one of their better, you know, world premiere movies. Um, so yeah, it just goes through the list, just nonstop guest spots, Smallville, Crossing Jordan. I remember mm -hmm. those. Um, 
Control Factor, I thought was a cool virtual reality movie, even though it was premiered on Sci-Fi Channel. It was just very taut, and it was just so cool to just see him with glasses, just being just a scientific exposition instead of just you know being wasted. Right. Scarecrow Slayer, I remember that was like the photo that was like on his IMDb for the longest time. Like, what is that photo from? Oh, it's from this asylum film called scarecrow slayer <laughs> i saw it a few years back and i was just i could not stop laughing at it he has to kill this killer scarecrow with a batch of dynamite <laughs> totally worth that's, it for that's the whole thing night. well the only plot. part of it the rest of it is just weird grunge rock music and a bunch of stupid teens getting high and eating pizza so i'm <laughs> <laughs> for a stupid horror game. movie, it was worth it. <laughs> I saw it free on YouTube. <laughs> Do it when you just need something stupid to make fun of. Um, I dug him in the Final Prophecy movie, even though that wasn't one of the best sequels. John might like him in Dark Assassin, which is a fun martial arts film. Mm, okay. This guy, Jason Yee, was like hot for a hot second there and then just disappeared, but he it was cool to see a guy just try and do on a micro budget, a Bruce Lee type tribute movie. Tony is really freaky in that one season one episode of Criminal Minds, and he's not even the main serial killer in that episode. <laughs> he's just the prisoner who's like giving them some advice on how to catch this guy. And he's like, well, why wasn't he the main bad guy of the episode? But it was, it didn't feel wasted. He was still very intimidating to where it's like they're having trouble just even getting a straight answer from him because they're just so scared to go in the room and sit down with him, even with an armored guard. <laughs> uh, and so then there was this independent film called Heart of the Beholder, which is talking about the religious right trying to, it was a true story, trying to silence controversial movies known only as The Last Temptation of Christ. So it's a cool docudrama movie made on a very low budget with an all-star cast and he has a cameo as chuck berry that's right the musician <laughs> plays chuck berry in a documentary about the religious right trying to silence the last Movies. temptation of christ yeah that can't be right that's actually really? a movie what is what, what is the name of this movie it's called uh heart of the beholder Heart and of the Beholder. He co-stars okay. in it with Michael Dorn. That's where I or from Star Trek. So brothers reunite. I just like to thank you for educating me. It feels like a wider world now. <laughs> and I like and I like Tony Todd, but I feel like I, I've only I've only I've only seen the tip of the iceberg of, of what he has to offer and maybe not offer, but I'll have to find out. I, hey, hey, he makes every movie for me worth watching. Uh, I saw him as an intimidating uh, gangster in Turntable. This is a very hard to track down movie. I might have to just give my copy to someone or just upload it to YouTube. It's so hard to find. I thought it was pretty cool. I didn't like how I paid 20 bucks for this fucker, but it is what it is. I liked how he was very suspenseful. They kept hinting at him and then he showed up, but it's a typical Reservoir Dogs type knockoff movie with some cool Law & Order type actors and some hip-hop playing. So, as Lord Hyken on Stargate, he was pretty damn cool on there. He got to play opposite of the cigarette-smoking man for that season, season seven. Uh, Shadow Dead Riot, I see, is, you know, where he's a voodoo practicing serial killer, and the title character uh, has often been, like, re-released a few different times it's like a cult movie it's like evil dead in a prison basically <laughs> yeah i looked that one up after you mentioned it it he's he's got those dreadlocks and he looks like he's got fangs mm -hmm. nice lots of fun uh and get this i once was talking to some other guys who had made some trashy direct video movies and they were like oh i hate it um, I, I was so tempted to for a minute to say well it's better than your you know <laughs> <laughs> Zero star piece of shit movie but i didn't i didn't want to instigate a fight with those bricks so but uh so he worked with john carl bugler quite a lot he was in this like eden formula which was like a continuation of roger corman's carnosaur shit fest um but i definitely can recommend the strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde just a giant ass all-star cast tim thomerson from trancers is in it deborah shelton peter jason from return of the living dead free it's a pretty fun retake and I like how they just made it more modern and 
the makeup was really damn good. And uh, I didn't, I couldn't stand Vernon Wells, you know, from Mad Max 2 and Commando. He just seemed like they just needed him to just be thrown in there just for the sake of just putting a name on the cover. It was like, how can you cast a good actor and just put him in this stupid ass role? But it is what it is. <laughs> Reunites him with Babylon 5 co star Tracy Scoggins. So she does a good job as the detective. <laughs> You know what you're getting with Vernon Wells, though. Like, oh, yeah. I'm getting Vernon Wells, but... <laughs> yeah, he's going to scream at the camera. He's going to fight somebody. He's got big square teeth. Mm-hmm. So then he was in Chicago Massacre, the story of Richard Speck. This was an interestingly filmed, yet very confusing, real-life, true-crime serial killer movie for me. The tone was there, but I was just like, just so confused. And apparently a lot of people were, who knew about the actual crime case really didn't like it because it just, it was very loose with the so-called facts. And so in this, Tony Todd plays a captain who basically does a dick measuring contest with another detective played by his Wishmaster co-star, Andrew Devoff. I found it watchable. Well, I didn't think it was a piece of shit, but it was very confusing. And then... Around the 2000s, he stars in Shadow Puppets, which co-stars opposite of Buffy stars Jason, James Marsters and Star Trek Enterprise babe Jolene Blaylock. I actually thought this was a very cool psychological, you know, thriller. Just yeah, like with like, Cube, just a yeah, bunch I, of these guys in a claustrophobic space just wake up and they're like, what the hell's going on? Who are you? Where are we? What are we doing here? Yeah, I haven't seen that one in years. I do remember thinking it was not bad, though. It was just a long time. Oh, right? yeah. It had like an abysmal rating, and I just saw it for free on Hulu. I'm like, this is very tight. You know, this is very respectable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then he's on The Man from Earth, which is kind of an underground kind of sci-fi mystery movie. Like, they already just came out with, like, with a sequel to it. It's just like one of those independent movies everyone's kind of heard of and just kind of just word of mouth. Like, it just slowly keeps, like, getting rediscovered on the on the streaming channels it's wild i was like man i thought i was the only guy who knew about it <laughs> and the script was by jerome bixley who was best known for writing a lot of classic twilight zone and star trek episodes so <laughs> it's like a hard hard sci-fi made on a low budget but still looks great and it's got a great rating too like 7.9 on imdb <sighs> so then he's in the prison film the mansfield 12 totally recommend uh i murders which it was an unusual serial killer movie. There's a bunch of others I haven't seen. Uh, but I totally recommend his Turn on 24. That's just, everyone should see that gory, psychological, <laughs> violent show. But, I mean, as that terrorist who takes over the White House, like, he just changed it all up. He just had to just really just, and that's what that show needed at that point. There was just so many villains by the dozens, just oversaturated. And when he was on there, he just flat out just killed it. It's like, yeah, this guy's not playing around. Already five different, you know, White House attendants have been capped in the head. And he is just, you know, storming in there. And he's like, Madam President, you are going to be executed. You know, it's just, there's no way around this. So you can read the damn thing or I can force you to read it, you know, or I can shoot your daughter. And this will go a lot quicker, you know? <laughs> it's that intensity. It, intensity. Uh, we should say that in Tony Todd's voice. Intensity. <laughs> if, if, I, if I could, I would. I would. So then he was in the second Transformers, and I will just say he was the best part about it, as being Tyler <laughs> Allen. I would say the same thing, too. <laughs> and I t have, I d have any of you seen uh, his appearance on Psych? <laughs> I think I remember his episode. But it was in season four, and he just plays this detective who's just looking creepy at Gus and Sean, and they're like, ah! <laughs> the whole <laughs> entire time. And it's just, <laughs> and it just at the end, it's like, oh, you guys, were, I was just waiting for you guys to just stick around and just leave me to the serial killer. Thanks. I'm going to arrest him now. <laughs> this whole time, you just think he's stalking them or something, or just like a sleazy private eye. And it's like, no. And then he just comes up and he just shows off his guns and everything. He's like, yeah. That was super nice. <laughs> <laughs> so then he's in just a bunch of other like horror anthology shows made for the internet and cable TV, which are fun. I definitely recommend that indie film he did called The Graves, where these two sisters are in a 
random mine. It's just kind of a fun throwback to a lot of those just running away from the cannibals and everything. Oh, yeah, I forgot that he was in that. That was uh, Brian Polito, I believe. Yeah, he, it uh, got the like... The of later, Lady Death, the old uh, comic book from the Dark Horse stuff back from the 90s. Yeah, I definitely thought it was a highlight because it was kind of one of those. Is bought, it was bought by After Dark Films, and I know After yes. Dark Films was one of those. It was kind of like Masters of Horror, where it was ambitious, but it didn't really kind of just land. It kind of just exited stage right with little fanfare. But I thought that was a lot of fun while watching that work one night. Yeah. And how ironic! I think he gets like stung to death by bees, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. yeah I that recall is there being some kind of homage, and I was just like. Man, he's getting a really gory death off screen. <laughs> oh. So then he's briefly on a bunch of other shows. I really thought he was pretty cool on the show Chuck. That was just a fun spy comedy altogether. But I mean, this is where I then start ha- having trouble like keeping up with any of his movies because a lot of them just never got released, like other than like festivals or something. <laughs> this is like, where can I buy this? <laughs> oh, I can't. There's a Jack the Reaper movie, and I'm like, I can't ever buy that anywhere. It's got a kick-ass poster. (laughs) He's playing a priest on the poster, so I'm like, yeah, I would like to watch this, but I can't find it anywhere. I see that. In 2011, he plays Mr. Steel. Mr. Steel. (laughs) How many punches through a door? I hope he bun- punch, or better yet, how about he punch like a serial killer in the face and his head explodes scanner style or some shit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, so I saw him in that movie with Mark Hansen and Michael Berryman and Kane Hodder called The Family. And I thought that was okay, even though the lighting was pretty bad. But he's in this other hood movie called Falling Away. And it's a really actually pretty deep movie. And I was really confused by it at first because there's a PG-13 rating on the cover and there's like constant pervasive language. So I'm like, yeah, this is R-rated. It's not, it's realistic, like in a way like The Wire, but it's not, <laughs> not for kids, not for teens. But this was really cool. He basically just was a man who just caused an accident for a school bus that killed a bunch of kids. And he's just literally just... I, you can just tell Tony's heart is in this one because he seems like a very passionate man, you know, in interviews. And here he's basically playing a guy just having a coming to Jesus moment. He's just like, I can't live with myself. I did a shitty thing. And he does pretty much just a lot of stretching out in front of the mirror and just looking at himself. But it's a pretty fast paced crime movie. He does that the same year as this other movie called Changing the Game. I watch pretty much anything that's on the boob tube, and this was a fun, another fun hood film. He plays a very demented, disfigured uh, gang member, and also has like a double role as an FBI agent. <sighs> so same year, he's also in Sushi Girl. He's the again not a Reservoir Dogs type, Pulp Fiction type movie, and he's later in the Call of Duty Black Ops series, and that was cool because he actually got to do the motion capture. You can actually find videos of that online. It's just awesome seeing actors just interact and, you know, what's being recreated on screen is actually them. So I saw Dead of the Night. This was another, this is involves the Jericho Manor. This is another movie that got, like, just shit upon, but I thought was watchable. He was at least the reason I watched it. <laughs> so... Did any of you see Dust of War or Army of the Dam? I did not see those. So Dust of War is a fun apocalyptic movie. Army of the Dam, basically, these idiots are filming a reality show in, in a uh, supposedly haunted house, and he's basically the zombie cleanup squad who doesn't believe there's actual zombies, but of course everyone gets slaughtered. It's oh, another... Yeah, I- yeah, I think that was the one I was mentioning earlier that I think I watched that I was like, I watched it for him and he wasn't really in it much. He so. wasn't in it much, yeah, but I thought I, he was just so good. Yeah. As much as I'm not a Rack Street Boys fan, I was just finding it just so fun just catching, I mean, solely Erna from Godsmack stars in this, you know, so I just, <laughs> and Michael Berryman makes a cameo and there's these other wrestler divas who are playing parts of the SWAT team. It just felt like they were actually just having fun, but not too much fun to where it's like, 
hey, yeah, sure, you had fun, but, you know, there's nothing here. I just was like, okay, so whoever's doing the, again, the lighting for this should quit their day job, but at least this is still very well framed and energetic and everyone seems to have a fun time before you get to all you know what you paid to see which is zombie slaughtering you know so and yeah so does he come in at the end or, or like in the middle somewhere uh both kind of okay <laughs> then he's in this other movie called vanish with danny trejo it's just another weird just kidnapping drama <laughs> And he's reunited with his Candyman director, uh, Bernard Rose, on a 2015 version of Frankenstein. And this has been playing on a lot of the AMC Shutter channels and even IMDb TV lately. I had the DVD, so it was another one where I kind of enjoyed the commentary track and the special features more than the actual movie. But it was worth watching, despite being slow as fuck. But he has a good role as a blind uh, guitar musician. I just th wish they had kind of just, I don't know. Frankenstein's monster just doesn't get much persona. And I get that's that's kind of where they're going, but I just would have liked to see a little more. But maybe that's just me. So then he's just starring in just like endless, you know, B, D list movies. I saw Agoraphobia. He's barely in that. Skip that one. And Live Evil was okay. Scream at the Devil was watchable, but not good. Um, Death House is another one that everyone's bitching about, and I definitely can't defend that one. <laughs> uh, Zombies from 2017, I thought was okay, but hardly memorable. It was kind of wasted in the Depp Collector. I'm sure, John, you saw yeah, that. Yeah, way wasted in that. I was like, he's the main gangster. Again, you're hinting at, and you only give him one scene? Yep, only one scene. He gets a lot to do, but I mean, even our pal, the friend of the show, Matt Poirier, the director of Video Connoisseur, was like, yeah, this is falling victim to too much just pacing and stretching it. <laughs> and... Then he's really briefly seen in Hellfest, which is like a total 80s slasher, you know, the horror themed amusement park movie. Yeah, he has a cameo in that. Yeah. I, I was like, when is he going to show up? Oh, there he is. This movie just got better. <laughs> yeah, he has a pretty memorable scene at the very least. But yeah, he's he, he's only in it for, for a couple minutes. Yeah. yeah. He reunites with Lance Henriksen in the horror western where they basically play these like ghosts of like infamous outlaws on a train. I really tried to give this, you know, it's all, but it's just so slow. And it, it, it had it down to a T. The script was there. The budget wasn't. <laughs> so he gets a cameo in The Final Wish, which is kind of a Wishmaster S slow burn movie that he actually said he enjoyed. He recommended the movie as well. And he liked working with Lynn Shea, even though they're not even in the same scenes together. But She's in it. Then he gets to play Zoom in the Flash TV show. <laughs> I think just the voice. I don't, yep. Uh, yeah, he just the voice. Actually, yeah, he just does the voice of the character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Plays a detective in the Scream TV show. He's kind of barely in Candy Corn. And then he's plays a real life black senator, uh, Benjamin Burke, in the Western Badland. Now he's back to just doing more, just movies that haven't yet come out yet, or as well as one of the Half-Life video games. And just, again, did any of you see Sky Sharks by chance? <laughs> no, I don't think I've gotten around to that yeah. one. <laughs> uh, it's like a deliberate, like, it just, it's, I can see why people were calling it like the expendables of like horror parodies. It's just like, it was like in the can for like so long. Like it was like completed in 2017, finally just got, released in 2020 and i was oh, just one of those yeah it, it's not like sharknado it's more just again just an outrage is just <laughs> get together i think you guys are just gonna be just guffawing at it like in a bruce campbell way it is just outrageous and just in on it um i thought tales from the hood free was way better than part two and it was last thing i saw him in 
looking at my IMDb ratings was Insight, a kung fu movie, and The Lockdown Hauntings, which was pretty boring. <sighs> so, yeah, other stuff has just been laced lately, like another makeup role for the Orville and voiceover for the Netflix uh, He-Man cartoon. So, he really can't do any wrong. Like, he's just demoralized. So, I'm going to let you guys all plug your shows. Um, Nathaniel, what are you going to be tackling next? Uh, sure. Uh, like I said, I do uh, At the Devil's Ball. Um, that uh, We're on Twitter at film uh, – uh, sorry, under uh, that's my Twitter account. Uh, at the Devil's Ball is at devils underscore AT. Uh, our next up, I think we're going to be troubling, uh, covering Big Trouble in Little China whoop, as whoop. part of our uh, – current theme this month in january um which is just sort of like uh my co-host named it comic sans comics um uh and it's sort of like <laughs> we just did the we just did the wraith uh and then we talked to uh greg deliso about his uh trauma film uh hectic knife so um next is big trouble in little china and then we're not really sure what the fourth one is we're thinking dark man um but yeah uh but yeah we we talk about horror movies and horror adjacent films in a positive and constructive manner and uh hope uh hope people check it out stellar uh danny what can we expect on legion podcast network <laughs> well i'll tell you what you know we're on a my, my uh, co-host and i rick morgan are on uh the hail ming power hour we uh are on the legion, <laughs> right we're on the legion podcast network we do mainly movies that the two of us have have watched and have a a love for um you know the 70s and 80s films of our of our youth and um you know new ones we just did uh prisoners of the ghost land not long ago just because somebody has to talk about that stuff um, <laughs> i have a lot of tony todd in my future i mean I, i'm gonna be honest i love him and and i was excited to talk about him but but there's a lot of work here and i need to give it some some real study uh, and i appreciate you bringing that to my attention oh um, it was fun it was just like with danny trail is like where it's just like just queue up just either buy up a bunch of shit on amazon or ebay or <laughs> just get the one two free movies going and just go through them you can go through them in a day is like pass made it through 20 minutes or saw the whole thing worth it or not worth it or good but he wasn't well used in it you know <laughs> right right on right on yeah so you true mean, just give give us a shot. Like like I said, I'm excited to hear you're doing uh, Big Trouble in Little China, and uh, it's one of our favorites too. Yeah, we almost called our podcast Six Demon Bag, but that was already done like three times over or something. Oh, oh yeah, probably absolutely. cover it when the inevitable sequel slash reboot comes out. And it's like yeah. <laughs> So yeah, right. yeah uh, uh, Ben, what's so what is the name of your podcast? Where do, where do we find it? Is it on Twitter or it, it's the the Hail Ming Power Hour, and it is on uh, Legion Podcasts. Okay. Yeah, you go to the Le there's two different Legion Podcast Network things, especially on Podbean, and you know his show will pop up. You know, so. Hail Ming. Yeah, yep. that's right, like a Hail Ming from Flash Gordon. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, and uh, and Ricky also Morgan is one hell of a dude. <laughs> yeah, Ricky Morgan is a is a, is a powerhouse, and I just kind of suck off of his batter. Oh, that doesn't sound good. I, I just kind of <laughs> utilize his motivation. I just say that. <laughs> I think I know what you mean. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just your mother with that mouth. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Ricky was on with uh, with John and I when we did the, we tackled uh, the Sam Raimi episode. And we were like, this guy reinvented three different kinds of cinema. <laughs> Horror comedy, superhero movies, and then just unusual dramas. He's <laughs> such a one hell of a guy. Very true. <laughs> Just like Ricky. So, but it was so fun because like I, it was one hell of an episode to actually prep for because it's like I had people from like so many different circles who like some who were really into Evil Dead but hadn't really seen anything else he had done and others who were like we like Spider-Man but don't really like you know superhero movies in general so it was like I didn't know what I was going to get I was like okay I have to play referee this is not good <laughs> I'm going to have an actual conversation here <laughs> so, it, it was really good it was just one one of those it was hell to prepare, prepare for. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Uh, so, uh, John, what are you reviewing next for the movie or the action elite? Oh, there's a possibility I might review the new screen that's coming out soon. Oh, sweet. Okay. That should be interesting. 
Yeah, it looks good. That's all I have on my plate right now. That's a lot. Yeah. That'll be. I'm sure that'll be. Uh, I, I'm sure that'll be uh, a pretty interesting film. So I think there'll probably be a lot to talk about there. Well, I'm also, looking forward to it. It's my favorite franchise, so I'll see how that holds up against the other ones. Totally. I just cool. recently caught that they were all available on some streaming service I had, and I I'd been turned off by by part two, but I went ahead and watched three and four, and they're actually way better than I thought they were going to be. I love three and four. I think that's particularly four. That's my favorite sequel of all of them. It's really good. Yeah, and I, I was even really surprised. We had other people on here who were just like, "Ah, I hate part four. I'm like, "Really? Out of all of you guys, <laughs> I would have thought you would have totally been in that wheelhouse for Wes Craven." But yeah, it is interesting just getting into that one because you know some people like Scream just because of the comedy in it. Other people like it just because again, you know, they're slasher completists, and other people just like it because they do like how it revitalized the genre and everything. And yep. It's just one of hell of a franchise to sum up because it just was one of those. It's just very inspirational, and yet just so many studios were just ripping it off, and it just got very annoying. <laughs> just satire is hard. <laughs> true. Yeah, very true. Um, so yeah, I guess. It seems like the new Candyman didn't really take off as much as it really did. I still have yet to see it, but I had, it. I had many pals who thought it was a lot of fun, but it was hard to gauge where they just are easily entertained or really, really dug in. And then I had others who were just like, hey, pass. <laughs> Not awful, but wasted my time. And I was like, hmm, interesting. And I just thought it was interesting just how Tony Todd just kind of came back into the spotlight for that, you know, and just for such a signature role and he's making a appearance in there again. And it kind yeah, of was yeah. wild how he had to be used on social media for that. They're like, Oh, I'm not seeing if Tony Todd doesn't come back. And they're like, well, Tony Todd is coming back, but he hasn't signed on yet. <laughs> he isn't in it much. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's taking the story in a whole different direction. And it, it has its moments. That I didn't think too much of it, but that hadn't really had nothing to do with uh, the amount of Tony Todd. But, um, but yeah, it was an okay film. As we know, the world needs more Tony Todd. That is true. <laughs> of course. Give us more Tony Todd. <laughs> give me, give me. <laughs> we'll return after these messages. JURS Podcast is proud to promote AutoCorrect, an independent film company with experienced industry professionals who can serve all your film industry needs. They include self-tapes, voice actor recordings, demo reel editing, script revisions, headshots, and much more. They're actor correct at your request. Book them on Instagram. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? Not enough podcasts about movies in your life? Why not try? They must be destroyed on sight! The new Podcast Cure All. Sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation. We have Italian horror. We have zombies. We have slashers. We have crime films. We have spaghetti westerns. We even have sci fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of. They must be destroyed on sight! As needed, and let the hosts, Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest host cure what ails you. Warning, may cause atrophy, African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin cough, colic, cramp colic, dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, mortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Oh, necrophilia. Oh, oh, oh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema Psyops is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, crude. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am in 
the most sincerest of senses disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. Oh, I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get it's out of. Unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this, like, little nerd glee with everything that kept Little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you, you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped from watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was How did you watch movie. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. Hey everybody, I'm Corey. And I'm Zach. And we're the hosts of Podcasting After Dark, a cast dedicated to late night horror and sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, often found on HBO and Cinemax. You know, the movies your parents didn't want you watching as a kid. You can find us every other week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. This is what you want. This is what you get. Greetings, friends. My name is Dean Legero, and I'm the host of the 3324 Podcast. I invite you to join me and my lifelong friend, Eric Kuber, to come with us as we discuss the music and movies that shaped our life. Each week, we'll pick an album or film that we really connect to and not only give you some great info and trivia, but also discuss, debate, and celebrate what it means to us and the journey it took us on. We also look forward to hearing from you and giving us some of your picks for us to check out and discuss. I think it'll be a really fun experience, so come along with us for the ride. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider, and at 3324.buzzsprout.com. Thanks for your time, and welcome to the 3324 family. It's late, it's time, let's check our cue, baby. Pair it with a couple brews, baby. We love good movies. We love the bad ones, too. So we watch them all and pass their lessons on to you. Oh, yeah. Everything I learned from movies helps to make life a little bit groovy. With a one last plot holes a gratuitous movies. It's time to get busy with your friend Steven Izzy. At eilfm.podbean.com. We now continue with our program. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up review show.